All right, here we go. The book of Job, as you can see on the screen, we'll start where we've started for the last um, different sessions. Where This is our final session tonight, and I'm going to try and, I actually have a lot to say, so I'm going to condense it as fast as I can because we really don't have a lot of time. they got to get in here with the kids and all. But um, as you know, a lot of the false teachings that we've been taught have come from the book of Job. A lot of the misery that the church has gone through and people have have endu in, endured or, or, you know, have lived through, have, have uh, uh, continued in, came from the idea that God was doing it. And they got that knowledge from the book of Job. And we're trying to debunk that. We want to make sure that people understand that the book of Job doesn't teach some of the things that we've been taught. And so, you know, we'll do a little bit of review, but we need to debunk that because you are the ground in which the word will be sown. And if your ground is contaminated, then the seeds that are sown into your life, the word of God, will be contaminated as well. They won't germinate correctly. There have been many people in the house of God, many people in the church, they've gone to church for years and years and years, and they live lives that were far beneath what God wanted them to live. How many know what I'm talking about? And, and it's been some of us. Some of us should have been further along in life. Some of us should have had more health in our life. Some of us, should, well, not some of us, all of us should have had that. But we, were, we, we believed and that we were held in bondage to a belief that somehow God was involved in that or that God was teaching us or training us or that God initiated it or God's thinking was that way. And, and I hope that when you're done with this, if, you'll, if you have listened to what I said, you'll have come to the conclusion, as I have, that God doesn't say what we have been told that he says here. And we did that through a lot of different things, to making sure that we interpret the book properly. The first thing that we dealt with was authoritative scripture. How do we interpret the book of Job? And what scriptures do we use to get the doctrine out of it? There's a, I mean, all of it is inspired word in the sense that it, was, it, it is written. It's contained within the Bible, and it's helpful. But not all of it can be used to build the doctrines out of it. In other words, there are just some things that were conversations. As a matter of fact, the majority of the book of Job was just a conversation had between people as if we were talking on the phone. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was God speaking. It just could be my thoughts or my feelings or my interpretation of what was going on. And the majority of the book of Job was written this way. We said chapters 1, 2, and 42 are authoritative scriptures. The reason we said that was because the Bible says holy men of old wrote as they were inspired of the Lord. We know that the writer would have been inspired. We know Elihu was the writer of the book of Job's. He describes himself as the writer. He tells us he's the writer. And when he writes, we know that his writings are inspired word. We can get doctrine from what was inspired. Chapters 38 and 41 are God speaking. We know that if God's speaking, and it is, it's not just a conversation between two people or somebody's thoughts, that this is, in fact, authoritative scripture. When God speaks, it's the word of God. So 38 through 41, we, we said, finally, chapters 32 through 37, Elihu again is speaking as the author, so that makes this authoritative scripture. So out of the, the 40-something, 42 uh, chapters of this book, 13 of these chapters can be used at, to interpret the book of Job. I did not say that we throw the rest out. I did not say they were not scripture. I said they were not to be used to form the doctrine that we form from this passage. We can't use somebody's negative views as, as authoritative scripture. Does that make sense? The next thing we dealt with is what the, what the book of Job does not teach. And we said God in this book does not teach us that he was the instigator of the problems that Job endured. He was not the one that caused all that happened to happen. It is incorrect teaching from Job that says God did this. God is the one who came up with the idea. God allowed it to happen to Job, and God designed the tests and trials for Job. Now, one of the problems, most people would say God doesn't do it. If I said to you, I would say God didn't do it, or God doesn't do that, majority of church people would tell me, you're right, Pastor Steve, God does not make people sick. God does not, you know, if I got into a good argument with any, any denominational teacher that maybe had taught that before, they, they would probably come to the conclusion, okay, they would probably come down off their high hill and say, all right, you're right, God doesn't do it, but they would say God allows it. They would say that. Many of you have had that argument and you heard them say God allowed it. The Bible does not teach that. It is not taught in the book of Job that God allowed this to happen. And some of that I'll cover tonight. The book of Job does not teach that it was because of Job's sin. It was not Job's sin. And this is important because... Many teachers teach that, that, that the reason people go through the things they went through is because there's something in their life. I got news for you. 
good people who love God, who are doing their best to serve God, go through things in their life. And we, don't, we need to stop condemning ourselves and always believing that it was something that we did. It could have been an omission. It could have been other things. And certainly, the vast majority of times, we could find something in our life that would point back to something we needed to correct that would fix the problem in our life or at least allowed it to go in. Many times, where we are, oftentimes, we get to some place in our life, and, and we get to this moment in our life, and then we try to judge everything by the moment. And the reality is, is we need to go back to the decisions we made far before we got to the moment. How many know what I'm talking about? I've sat in the office. I'll give you an example. I sit in the office. Oftentimes, I do marriage counseling while I'm in there. You know, I'll have people that are about to break up or they're about to fall apart. Or maybe they have fallen apart. And, and, and if I'm having, say, a divorced couple, is a, a divorced man or divorced woman is coming in, they're now dating somebody they want to get married. I'll always ask the question to whoever it is, what was your contribution to your divorce? And that's a tough question because I, up to this point, I, don't have, I haven't had anybody that came in and said, let me tell you something, I was the problem, it was my fault, I'm the reason I got divorced. That's pretty funny, but it's true. Nobody ever comes in and says, I was a schmuck, you know, I was terrible, she should have left me and she did, thank God. It's always about them, you know, what they did. And then I'll, I'll take it back. I'll keep going, okay, well, you know, and, and oftentimes we'll go right back to when you got married, did you have a check in your spirit about it? Should you have married them? Oh, Pastor Steve, I should have never married them. I knew walking down the aisle is the wrong thing to do. <laughs> and that's usually how it goes. All true. And if we'll do that with our life as a whole, we can go back and look at times when God told us to turn right and we turn left. When God said, don't do that, we did it. And, uh, and, and over time, those things add up. And so ultimately what I like to say to you, though, that's not always what the case is, that there's some omission or some sin that we've done. Sometimes the devil just attacks. He goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The book of Job does not teach another thing. Now, I want to put this in perspective so because there's a lot of doctrine out there, and I have personally espoused this myself only to feel today a little bit different about what I did espouse 18 years ago in ministry. This is 18 years later, and of course I think I've come to a little bit better understanding of the difference between fear and faith and different things like this. But most of the teaching among faith teachers teaches that the thing that Job feared the most came upon him. And, that, uh, that, and, and I think there's some truth to that, but I'd like to make it more clear. I think a clarifying of that would be better. And so here's what the correct, here's the, the book of Job teaches this, that Job greatly feared. He greatly feared. That is a correct teaching. It does teach that in the book of Job. It says, Job greatly feared. Job's words in chapter 3 give us an understanding of Job's state of being. It was his belief that allowed an opening for terrible things to happen in his life. And we, on the other hand, need to walk by faith. So... The teaching is, and, and, and rightfully so, but I'm going to define it in a greater measure, that Job greatly feared. Here's what it says in Job 3.25. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I dreaded has happened to me. Now, we know from the Word of God that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things cannot, that I can't see. Job didn't know this. Job didn't have New Testament Scripture. He didn't have a Savior. He didn't have... Uh, a doctrine of devils. He didn't have any of that. All he had was him living on the earth. There was no law. There was no Mosaic command. There was no rites or rituals. There was nothing. There was no religious uh, uh, temperament at all. It was before. The, this is the first book of the Bible written very differently. And so Job is completely oblivious to most things going on that we already know as Christians. We know these things. We have had the revelation of these things. Job didn't have it. So Job, we understand that there are two types of fear. There's a godly reverential fear, and then there's a worldly fear or a dread. Now, in this particular scripture, it's talking about worldly fear or dread. He had a dread or a worldly fear. But I want to show you something in Hebrews chapter 4. Look at what it says. It says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So, in this passage in Hebrews, we're told to have a fear. So there is a reverential fear or a godly fear that is not a, 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 a earthly, demonic, devilish, natural fear. So, so what was Job dealing with? In the, for the most part, in the book of Job, um, 
we can see that he was operating in a godly fear or a fear because he didn't know. And so the only thing he knew was God was there. And so everything that he suspected to be causing the problems in life had to be God. It couldn't be anything else. He didn't know of anything else. So he had a reverential fear towards God that, that I'm doing something or something's not right. Or, and so in doing so, he, he greatly feared God in a reverential sense. And he also greatly feared something that was going to come upon him. But we know that the Bible says this, that anything, and I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but this is godly fear or a type of reverential fear here in Hebrews 4. Apparently, Job was not operating in a devilish type of fear because God said these things that happened to Job were without cause. Now, if it happened without cause, then fear itself was not, not the way we've been taught, right? If God said what happened to him was without cause, right? Then, it, then we cannot say that the fear was a devilish form of fear that caused this. Not only that, but even the passage that I read to you came out of an unauthoritative part of the passage. Does anybody see what I'm saying? So afraid and fear are two different things. And I'm not going to get into that, but they're not the same thing. It's, it's one thing to be afraid. You know, uh, today when there was wind blowing outside and the, and, the, and the things were howling and all that stuff, my kids were a little afraid when they started seeing the basketball go blow by and all this stuff. But they weren't in sin. You understand? They weren't in sin because they saw the basketball go, go by. This is Job. He's not in sin. God said it was without cause. Is that fair? So the fear mentioned in Job is mostly a fear of God or in a reverential way. But the fear message in the, in the passage that I read in chapter 3 means something a little bit different. It means it was a belief in opposition to God. It wasn't fear, scary boo, uh, boo. It was he had a belief. He had a belief. Job is expressing a belief of dread. He believed that something was going to come upon him, and it did. He was believing in something. How many know belief is the thrust of faith? Belief brings us. He had heard information or had information, and he had trusted in the information that he had and formulated a belief. We call that fear, and the Bible called that fear, but we can't say it was sin because he was without offense. He didn't do anything. So no direct sin had been committed. Since we know what happened to Job was without cause, then it is clear that Job did not experience what he did because of fear in the form of sin. Or fear is a sin. The Bible, however, does say that what is not of faith is sin, meaning, the word there, the word sin means death. In other words, you can have a belief unto death. Does anybody see it? Or a faith unto death. A faith unto death. Belief and faith are different. One is information received. Another is an information received from God, revealed by God, and acted upon by God. Belief is not a, 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 a action of faith. It is not faith acted on. It is simply the information received and obtained. This is what I said about the treadmill. If I went to the, to the gym today, I thoroughly believe that what they tell me is true. If I get on the treadmill, put it at 15, run for an hour and a half, you know, I do this every day for six weeks. I'm going to probably lose, you know, 100 pounds or whatever. I believe every word of it. I haven't done anything about it. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. So I got the belief, but I have not acted at all on it at all. So I have a belief. Job had a belief, but it wasn't a godly belief. And we call that fear. And the Bible called that fear. I'm saying this because I want you to know that Job didn't sin. This didn't come upon him because of some sin that he committed. But the Bible teaches us that he had a belief. He greatly feared something. He had a, an idea. Job's belief or fear led to a lack of faith, which resulted in death. In other words, it, the fact is this, that the fear and belief that he had isolated or insulated him from a belief in God. What could have kept him from receiving all the things the devil did was a knowledge of God or a faith in God, which he did not have. He didn't have that. In other words, he didn't have the ability. He had, he had a belief in another area. Can anybody see what I'm talking about? Job was not using any form of opposition to the destruction of the devil. He opened the door and invited the devil to do what he did. He offered no opposition 
to the devil. Look at Job 1, 4 through 5. And the sons would go down and feast. Now, this is authoritative scripture. Look what he says. The sons would go down and feast in their houses each day as appointed and would send and invite their sisters to come and eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job had sent to sanctify them and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of all of them. For Job said, now we know we have what we say, don't we? For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Can you see this? In other words, what this is telling us is that Job's fear or belief, there was a belief there that his sins had feared him. He was acting on. How many know when you go out to your car and you start it, you have to have faith that the key in the car is going to start? That's a natural fear or a natural faith, right? That's natural faith. Faith is not just supernatural faith. There is natural faith. And he was operating in a natural faith, and he was believing, even though he didn't realize it, that for the open door for the devil to come. He had created and invited and attracted the very thing that he dreaded the most. He was acting out his faith every day, and his faith was not in God. Every day. He went down every day. Now, now doesn't that surprise you? I mean, you can now see that he had created the, the very environment through a belief system that brought all of this into his life and he had done nothing to obstruct what the devil was going to do or did. God didn't initiate it. God didn't allow it. God didn't do it. Job did. Job, through his actions and words and his faith, his belief, had created the open door. God was honor bound. So I'll say this. Job left himself wide open for whatever the devil wanted to do to him. And God was honor bound and would not intervene. It's not that God could not intervene. God can do anything. Look at somebody and say, God can do anything. That's not true. If he could, why don't he make you pay your tithe? Because he gave you a will. You have the right to decide. Now, in the sense of power himself as a God that's all-knowing, all-powerful, sovereign, could he do that? Yes. Just like he could create a rock big enough he couldn't carry. Somebody said, could God create a rock big enough he couldn't carry? Yeah, but he ain't stupid and he wouldn't. <laughs> he wouldn't do that. That's just ridiculous. How insane would that be and God wouldn't do it? Fair enough? God can decide. God had decided by giving man the earth. Remember, he turned the earth over to man. He said, I give you dominion and authority. You name the fish. You name the birds. You name the sea. You do all of it. You have complete control and authority. He gave it to him. Just as if I would lease you a house or give you a house. Sure, the Lord, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But if I give you a lease on my house, then you get to do what you want to in my house. And I have very little to say about it except for what's in the least. God turned this, this, this world over to mankind, Adam, and said, this is yours. You do what you're supposed to do in here. Man, I'm going to run out of time. I don't know what I'm going to do. And i got a long way to go. The, the point is this, <laughs> that, that, that Adam then, in that garden, then basically subleased this property, earth, to the devil. He made Satan the God of this world. Not God. God didn't do that. Adam did that. Adam took what belonged to him, given to him by God, and released the authority to, to the devil over it. The devil has authority over this planet. The devil has rulership over this planet. Now, it doesn't ultimately belong to him. We know it doesn't. He'll be thrown into a lake of fire. He's going to be destroyed. We understand all that. But until that happens... Until he's thrown in the lake of fire, until he's chained up, until he is defeated forever, there is authority that he has. He has the right to be here. He has the right to do. And so God could not violate his own word. God was duty and honor bound not to involve himself in the affairs that Job had created by his words and his actions. Can you see it? And so this was not God allowing it. It was Job's allowance. Job had allowed it. 
Job left himself open. It was Job's choice to believe what he did rather than have faith in the promises of God. He offered no opposition. Next, the book of Job does, it teaches that tragedy does not always come upon great sinners. Tragedy does not always come upon great sinners. One of the direct applications of the book of Job to our life is to let us know that tragedy does not always come to great sinners. Acts 28, 3 through 6. Remember Paul and the viper. I went through this last week. And when Paul was gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there was a viper that came out of the heat and fastened to his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hanging from his hand, they said among themselves, so here he is, a godly man serving God, had an angelic visitation, thrown off a boat, standing on the shore, serving God. He's a holy man of God, and a, and a snake jumped out of the pit. And he didn't do anything to deserve it. There was no sin in his life. Nothing had occurred. It just attacked him. How many of the devil's looking to attack all of us? And the world we live in, because he lives in it too, he has the right to do that. Now, there is a difference between Job and, and us, and I'm going to get there. And so it goes on to say, no doubt this man, they said to themselves, no doubt this man was a murderer, and he has escaped the sea, yet vengeance has suffered him to, not to live. And he shook off the beast in the fire and felt no harm. And after that, they turned around and said, wait a minute, he's a man of God. I mean, I paraphrase that, but that's what they said. So, so they, just like Job's friends, looked back and saw this attack of the devil, had, and because they knew no better, they accused him of being a sinner. He wasn't a sinner. And so we know that Paul simply experienced an attack of the devil. Paul knew how to stand on the word of God. Paul released his faith. And although the vast majority of things and tragedies come by a means of something we've left open a door, Job lets us know that it's not the only means of being attacked. Sometimes godly people face issues. But in the New Testament standing, you and I don't have to live in those issues. They may come, but they don't have to stay. I have authority. I can take authority over the works of the devil. Tragedy doesn't always come upon great sinners. Job 1, 9 through 12. Then, Job, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou made a hedge about him and hast his house and all of his, on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and the substance is increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he hath. He'll curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold... Now listen, that word behold is a discovery word. It is a question word. Have you. It is not give you. It is have you. All that you, all that he hath in his, in his in, is, is in thy power. All that he hath is in thy power. In other words, God was saying, behold, behold, you get it? All that he hath. Now this is, this is my belief. I'm not a theologian, but this is what I see here. And so it goes on to say, only upon him put not in your hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Satan desired to sift Job. Satan was the initiator of the entire thing. Luke 21 or 22, 31 gives us another parallel from the New Testament. And the Lord said to Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Verse 32 goes on to say, but I have prayed for you, and thy faith would not fail, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now here's what we know. The devil came to sift Job. That's what he came to do. But Jesus was not there. In, in Luke, we have a Savior. Before Jesus, there was no Savior. There was nobody that would stand in the gap for us. There was nobody to pray for us. Job didn't have any of that. And Satan came to sift him. Before Jesus, there was no intercessor. New Testament, we have a Savior. God was simply loving Job and blessing Job out of mercy and grace, not because of justice. We live under justice, just as if we'd never sinned. So we can act out of justice. We have a Savior that came and has redeemed us from the curse of the law, redeemed us from the clutches of Satan, redeemed us from the attack of the enemy. We don't have to live under that attack. Job didn't have that. God gave him all that he gave him and it blessed him by grace, mercy, and love. And so to us, it's, it's more than that. It's justice. Job was in Satan's kingdom. Job was not born again and therefore he had no rights and privileges. Can you see it? There was no Savior. 
God did not initiate these things. God was not judging sin in Job's life. God was abound to what man had done. God did not allow Satan to do this. God would not intervene because of his word. God had not yet redeemed man. God had, so Job had no recourse, or God had no recourse to the condition that man had created. And there were two possible reasons why that Job could not uh, have his life touched. The first one was, the Bible says, the words of our mouth. The Bible says that we have the power of life and death in our tongue. He was not capable. The devil didn't have the right to kill him. The words of our mouth are required to have access, and he didn't have access through his mouth. As long as Job would not curse God and die, and because Job was not yet satisfied. The Bible says, with long life, I'll satisfy you. I'm giving you some reasons why he couldn't touch him. Satan could not legally attack his life. The second reason is Satan didn't think he needed to. How many know the devil's dumb? He thought he could just attack his stuff and Job would give in. But it didn't happen, did it? Colossians 1, 12 through 14, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who hath delivered us, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We have been transferred, translated, and delivered into the kingdom of light. But to be delivered into the kingdom of light meant we were once in the kingdom of darkness. Job was in the kingdom of darkness. Can you see it? Before you are born again, you were in the power of the darkness of the devil's kingdom. We were held to the earthly kingdom with Satan in charge of that kingdom. He was under, Job was under the control of the devil. Satan had a legal right to do what he did. Job, although all that was true, Job never cursed God. For I, uh, Job 19.25, for I, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he stands at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. So he never cursed God. The book of Job does not, or does teach, we are not to attack God's integrity. Now this is important. Let me just read you a few of these things. There's a whole bunch of them, and I'll just read a few of them. Listen to what Job did in his speaking. Uh, Job 6.24, teach me and I'll hold my tongue and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. In other words, arrogantly, he says to God, show me I'm a sinner. Show me what I've done. He's questioning God's character. So the book of Job teaches us clearly we are not to do this because God rebuked Job. Right? So, return I pray you. This is Job 6, 29 through 30. Return I pray you. Let it not be iniquity. Yea, return again. My righteousness is in it. Is there iniquity in my tongue? Can, I, can my taste discern and preserve things? In other words, he's saying, I know I didn't sin. I don't know why you're judging me, but I know I didn't sin. But God wasn't judging him, was he? He was, he was testing or questioning God's character. Job 9, 17 and 18, for he breaketh me with the tempest and multiplies my, moon, my, my, my wounds without cause. He's saying, you have no cause to do this to me, God. Well, he didn't know the devil was doing it. But he's questioning God. This is, this is very important. In all these scriptures, I could keep going and show you all this that he continues to, why did you do this? You are uncharacteristic. God, why are you this way? I'm without sin. And he even defended himself at the expense of God. He wouldn't even defend God. Personally, I, I, mean, I, I mean, think about what he did. I mean, here's, listen to this, Job 27 two. As God lives, who, who hath taken away the, my judgment, the Almighty who hath vexed my soul. You know, why are you doing this? But it wasn't God that was doing it. The reason he did this was because there was no concept of Satan. There, there, there was nothing there. But here's the problem with it. Here's what you and I have to understand. Why did I show you this? Why is this a, a, a teaching in the book of Job? Because you and I are supposed to learn from Job. All of that didn't change anything. And all the scriptures I could read to you. Just literally dozens of scriptures that he would accuse God and say things to God and attack God. See, we do that. And we're not supposed to. That Believers are supposed to know better. We have no excuse. Why do we have no excuse? Because number one, we have a Savior. Look at somebody and say, you have a Savior. As such, that means that you have somebody that makes intercession for you before God. You are, I mean, you should know better than when things come and attack you, you go, why'd you do that, God? 
And I can't think of a person in this room that hadn't done it, including myself. Y'all may not want to admit it, but sometime in your life you've gone, why God? And attack God as if it was God. God, I ain't done nothing. what I do? Have you done it? Raise your hand if you did it. That is, that, is a, that is a mentality that I think is a natural mentality that comes as a human being. It's something we as part of our humanity. But we don't have, the, the, the Bible tells us in Job, this is not something we are allowed to do. We are not allowed to get into the hospital room and blame God for it. We are not allowed to have a car accident and accuse God as being the cause and author of it. Book of Job teaches me because God rebuked him and Elihu did the same thing. Elihu said, who are you to rebuke God? Who are you to accuse God? So on two occasions, Job was rebuked for accusing God falsely. Giving God credit for something that wasn't God's doing. Folks, we're not allowed to give God credit for the negative and terrible things in our lives. We don't have the right to stand there and accuse God of things. This is clear because, again, trying to help you understand, God did not initiate Job's disaster. God did not do Job's problem. The book's uh, clear to us. It tells us it wasn't because of his sin. He was without cause. And all of this happened. We're told so many of these things about the fear issue that I brought up to you, that it was Job's own doing. It was his own openness. It was man's failure on the planet. And for us to accuse God really is something we are not allowed to do. When you get into a challenge or a condition, we are not to say God allowed it. We are not to say God did this. God rebukes that. That's inappropriate. When problems come, they come from the devil. Look at somebody and say, if you got a problem, it came from the devil. John 10.10 10 says the thief came to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came. You and I are redeemed. We've been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you think the devil could attack you in the heavenly place? You're not supposed to let him. You're supposed to fight him. If you don't know that, then you're just going to allow him. You as believers are supposed to fight the devil. You're not supposed to lay and wallow in it. You're not supposed to lay there and absorb it and continue in that thing. I mean, it may stay for a little while, but you keep fighting. The Bible says you fight the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith. Put your belief in God. Put your trust in God. Stand with God and say, listen, this is the thing that will change your life if you ever realize that the stuff you're going through that's bad ain't from God. If it ain't good, it ain't God. I think we ought to say that one more time. If it ain't good, let me tell you what the word tells me as a believer. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, my faith. No weapon formed shall prosper. I'm preaching real good now. And every believer that's New Testament has to have that thinking. And that's why it's so important that we teach this to you, that we tell you, no. Because people will come and you'll say, you know, what's going on in your life? Well, the devil's whooping up on me. Well, why? Why are you letting him? Why? The Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee. You have been returned the authority of God on this planet for your life. You have been given again the authority to resist the devil. You have been given the authority. He's under your feet. He's been defeated. The Bible says he was defeated. He says he was defeated. He's been put under our feet. Amen. Amen. He's, the Bible says God spoiled, Jesus spoiled principalities and powers, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Somebody ought to shout out amen. amen. Come on, I'm preaching real good. Amen. Or teaching real good, I'm not sure which. But anyway, Job didn't know these things. Job didn't have access to the. Job didn't have a Jesus. Job didn't have the Bible. Job didn't have all the, uh, uh, the protection that he needed. Job uh, had a belief system that led him into a mess. Do not categorically ever put yourself in the Job position. You are nowhere and in any way as a born-again believer ever in a Job condition. Never. 
And if you're going to get anything out of the book of Job, you need to get what I've taught you. And that is, God didn't do it, be, God didn't do it to him. God didn't initiate it. God didn't invent it. God didn't create it. Man did. You need to know. It didn't come because of a great sin. Sometimes you can be the great Christian serving God, doing all that you can, and your roof might blow off because we live in a world with tornadoes. But even if your roof blows off, the Bible says that no matter what the devil does, God said all things, come on somebody, you can't not describe yourself as having a Job experience. When we look at God in this scripture and we see what God did, number one, in chapter one we see God was always blessing him and that he had mercy, grace, and, and the love of God. And until the devil came and attacked him, all God was doing was pouring into him. That's God's character. And then at the end of this book, we see that God restored him. When he finally found out his authority, and he prayed for his friends and took authority over his mouth and changed his confession and changed his attitude and started realizing after he'd been rebuked that he asked for forgiveness. You understand what I'm saying? Then God took that same blessing and multiplied. The Bible says he'll multiply the seed sown. It may have cost him something for the devil and the stupidness that he went through, but God always has a payoff that's always better than the first thing you went through. He doubled him and blessed him with double. I expect the devil to always pay a dividend and a price for what he attacked me with. I don't walk around. Come on, somebody. I don't walk around hoping I just get back what he took. I want it back, and I want some more. I don't just want, I want restoration, then I want reparation. I don't just want restoration. You're going to owe me some reparation. You can't take my stuff. You can't attack my body like that. You can't mess with my mind. You can't take my stuff. You don't have a right to take my stuff. I have authority and dominion. God said it. I'm not coming down to your level. We're going to get to heaven one day, and we're going to see the devil. The Bible said we're going to look at him and go, it was you? That's what it says. It was you? In my mind, I'm thinking when I get there, we're going to see this puny, pansy-looking, you know, limp, thing that just, you know, <laughs> virtually retarded, brainless, dumb thing. How dumb do you have to be to go against God? How stupid do you have to be to fight God? That's what the devil did. How dumb? He got to be so stupid. And we're worried about that? No, sir. No, sir. No, I've triumphed in God. I have victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The devil may come in one way, but he'll flee me seven. Come on. I could keep going. I could keep on going. I can't because my wife's got to come in here, but. I hope that you understand from this teaching. There were some that I had hoped would come because I felt like they're still stuck in that. They believe that God killed their wives and killed their cat and killed their dog and wrecked their cars. And, you know, they lost children. Let me tell you, if you lost a children, it's a tragedy. If you lost a child, God never intends for a child to leave before a parent. Not ever. And the devil owes big time. I think we ought to feel that way about everything. The devil owes us big time. He said, I love the scripture. says, redeem the time for the days are evil. That gives me so much hope because that means that whatever I've lost, I can get it back. It can be mine again. It can be mine again. Whatever. Somebody said, well, you know, I was supposed to be here in life. Well, go there. Go there. Be that. Do that. Go ahead. What's holding you back? I can do all with God, all things are possible. Nothing is him. That's where we live. I'm not going to teach nothing different. I'm not teaching nothing else. That's what we are. That's who I am. I've been redeemed. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Seated in heavenly places. All right. That's the end of Job. <laughs> Did anybody get anything out of it? Amen.